Welcome back to From the Bookshelf for another book club episode. We're going to be diving back into City of Bones for our part three, where we'll be looking at chapters nine and 10. Before we get started, go down and hit that subscribe button so you can get notified for the latest episodes as they come out. Also for this episode, I will be switching things up just a little bit, as well as the chapter titles. I will be leaving the page numbers somewhere around here for you. So if you're following along, it'll be a little easier for you uh, to keep up with uh, what page we're at as we go through it. So let's get started with chapter nine, the circle and the brotherhood. So the first thing we'll be looking at is on page 132 where uh, they're going in back into the Institute. And by they, I mean Jace, Clary, and Simon. They're headed to the Institute, and it says, Jace reached into the neck of his shirt and pulled out a brass key on the end of a chain. It looked like the sort of key one might use to open an old chest in an attic. I mean, it's a great image. I love that image of this, like, old, kind of, like, forgotten key opening the doors to the Institute. But as we've seen in this series, as well as the prequel series, any shadow hunter can enter the Institute. They don't need a key. Just the fact that they have shadow hunter blood opens the doors, even if they're locked. So it seems like this key is kind of like symbolic and he doesn't really need it. So I just don't see kind of like the point of him actually using it. If by him opening the door, it will just open for him. So I just found that interesting that he has this key, even though he doesn't need it to actually get in. On page 136, so here we have Isabel, who upon seeing Clary and Simon says this, oh my God, she said with finality, you brought another Monday. Hodge is going to kill you. So we've already established in a prior episode that Jace isn't the one who brought Clary. And even if he did, Clary isn't a mundane. She's a shadow hunter. Proof of that is the uh, the rune that Jace put on her. Didn't turn her into a forsaken, so she has to be a shadow hunter. But Jace didn't bring her in the first place. Hodge asked him to go get her and to bring her to the Institute. So he, all he did was bring Simon. So why would he be upset that he brought another mundane when he didn't even bring another mundane? I don't know. It seems like Izzy's just using it as an excuse to get all upset about uh, Clary being there because she clearly doesn't like Clary at this point. And I don't know, I don't kind of see it. It's almost like she's jealous of the fact that there's another girl in the Institute and she's never really had to be kind of around another girl in that situation. So I don't really know. It doesn't really explain the situation with uh, Isabel. So let's move on. We're going to go to page 145. So in this part, we're going to look at the oath that the uh, members of the circle would take. The circle being uh, Valentine's uh, group that he created. So it says, I hereby render unconditional obedience to the circle and its principles. I will be ready to risk my life at any time for the circle in order to preserve the purity of the bloodlines of Idris and for the mortal world with whose safety we are charged. So... My thought on this when I'm reading it is if you take out the words a circle and exchange it for the clave or shadow hunters, it almost sounds like an oath that any shadow hunter would give. I mean, think about it. I hereby render unconditional obedience to the clave and its principles. I will be ready to risk my life at any time for the clave in order to preserve the purity of the bloodlines of Idris and for the mortal world whose safety were charged. I mean, think about that. Like you interchange those words and it's like just any other oath that a shadow hunter would give, right? Because that's what they do. They, they give themselves unconditionally to the cause of protecting the world. So it says the mundane world, the mortal world that they're charged to protect. That's what shadow hunters do. So if you take out that circle, it's not really anything bad, or at least it doesn't appear that way because it just sounds like any shadow hunter giving an oath to the clave that they serve, the other shadow hunters and stuff like that. However, Clary says it sounds creepy, like a fascist organization or something. So saying that the circle sounds creepy, she's essentially saying shadow hunters sound creepy, which is kind of an interesting thought if you think about it. 
So let's move on. We're going to go to page 149. So in this part, Clary is kind of um, in her own head, just like kind of like describing how Hodge looks. She says she thought how odd it was that his gray hair and scarred face, he looked so much older than her mother, and yet they had been young people together. Which is interesting because what I believe from what I've read in previous books is that Hodge is actually a couple years younger than Jocelyn and than Jocelyn and Valentine and all of them. So it's interesting that he seems to have aged so much. So it makes you wonder if the curse that the clave put on him is punishment for his actions in the circle is kind of what aged him. Did that age him? Because I mean, if he's the same age as uh, Jocelyn and Valentine or even a little bit younger, would he really look as much so much older? I mean, I think they're maybe in their 40s um, because they were probably in their early 20s when uh, the uprising happened. So I mean, at 40 and he looks so much older, it makes you wonder if the uh, curse actually took a physical toll on him as um, well as stopping him from being able to leave the Institute. So it's something to think about. So then we're going to move to page 151. So in this one, it's kind of a, a thought on the show. The show kind of made the New York Institute this huge like hub of the Shadowhunter world and how it was such an like an honor to work there and how the Lightwoods were like prestigious getting this job in this position, but it's wrong. Like, listen to this, like what it says. <laughs> Talking about um, the punishment that the Lightwoods received was a lot less than what Hodge received, even though they did the exact same thing. It says, there were extenuating circumstances in their case. They were married, they had a child, Alec, right? So, although it is not as if they reside in this outpost far from home by their own choice, we were banished here, the three of us. The four of us, I should say. Alec was a squalling baby when they, when we left the glass city. They can return to Idris on official business only, and then only for short times. I can never return. So we see from this section that the punishment the light was received was to go to the Institute in New York. That it's like this little tiny outpost of an Institute that nobody goes there, that it's literally just them and their children and Hodge. It's not an honor. It's kind of like the uh, Clave's way of shoving them off to the side, putting them out of everyone's mind and getting them out of like the center of the, um, the Shadowhunter world because of their loyalty previously to Valentine. So I just think it's interesting that this aspect of that was lost in the show and they just kind of like threw that out the window and made it seem like, oh, they were never punished. <laughs> it's like they're not running the Institute because everyone thinks they're great. They're running the Institute as a punishment. Kind of like, um, spoiler alert, it's kind of like when um, Helen and Eileen get sent to an island out of the middle of nowhere to study the wards. They don't get sent there as something great because they're they're doing something great by studying the wards. They get sent there as in like exile. That's kind of what this is, exile. So um, let's move on. So now we have page 155. And so in this section, Hodge is talking about Valentine and the things that he was um, that he was capable of. It says he would have sacrificed his own son for the cause and could not understand how anyone else would not. Alex's response is he had a son. So Alex's response is like he had no idea. And then Hodge says he's speaking figuratively, but he's not speaking figuratively. Like he had a son. The entire clave knows he had a son because him and Jocelyn had a son before the uprising happened. And then as far as the clave is aware, both um, Valentine and his son died in the fire that destroyed um, Fairchild Manor. So they know, or they believe they know, that Valentine and his son died. So why is it such a secret that he had a son all of a sudden? Why is this all of a sudden something 
we're not allowed to know. It's, I don't know. I just find it interesting that he's talking about speaking figuratively when the clave literally believes that Valentine died in a fire with his child. I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting that the way that the lies kind of like fall. It's like you tell one lie, you tell another lie. It's like, in this instance, you don't need to lie <laughs> because it's something that you could look up and find the truth of. Um, so let's move to the next, the next topic on page 160. So in this, we're looking again at um, Clary kind of like foreshadowing both what she is capable of doing and also the story. So let's read. The room was all gold and white with high walls gleamed like enamel and a roof high above clear and glittering like diamonds. Clary wore a green velvet dress and carried a gold fan in her hand. Her hair twisted into a knot and spilled curls made her head feel strangely heavy and every time she turned to look behind her. You see someone more interesting than me, asked Simon. In the dream, he was mysteriously an expert dancer. He steered her through the crowd as if she were a leaf caught in the river current. He was wearing all black, like a shadow hunter, and it showed his clothing to good advantage. Dark hair, lightly brown skin, white teeth. He's handsome, Clary thought, with a jolt of surprise. So this scene goes on and it shows um more of this but i only recently realized like what i was reading here is something you see that kind of foreshadows something that happens not just at the end of this series the moral instruments but in um kind of like the next series in the shadow hunter universe um and it's just interesting that she kind of like planned it out here because as we know that these dreams of Clary's are more than dreams. So it's interesting to see um, the way Cassandra Clare kind of like layers her story to like show you what's going to be happening so much later on and you just don't realize it here while you're reading it. You think it's just some crazy dream that she's having because crazy things are happening, right? So it's just, uh, it's interesting to see how she layers her work and stuff like that. And it's one of the reasons I, I really love her books. So let's move on to the next part, which is on page 163. So in this part, um, we see Church, which is the, uh, the cat that lives in uh, the Institute. And he's more than a cat, as we've seen. He's capable of a lot of things. And we see him in uh, more than just the Mortal Instruments series. So Church is leading Clary and Jace um, somewhere in the Institute. That's what he does. He kind of like knows what's going on. He's a super smart cat, more than a cat. Um, so it says, Church was still with them, muttering and circling restlessly. What's with the cat, Clary asks. The silent brothers make him nervous. Sounds like they make everyone nervous. I mean, that's true. The silent brothers make everyone nervous. They're like super creepy um, with their looks and like the way their eyes are sewn shut. And um, they speak through their minds and stuff like that. But this scene... You have to read um you have to read the infernal devices the clockwork series that's a prequel to this one set in london in the 1800s to really get this reference but um church isn't nervous and for those who know you know he's not nervous he's looking for somebody he knows the silent brothers are there and he knows that there's somebody with the silent brothers that he adores so um, for anyone who hasn't read the uh, Infernal Devices, I won't like spoil anything, but if you know, you know who I'm talking about. And I love that because you don't know when you're reading this for the first time until you like, you read the Infernal Devices and then you go back and reread this book. That's when you get this and only then. And that's, again, like I was saying previously, it's one of the reasons I love about her is just she add these little things in almost like she knows she's going to be doing this way later on and that's phenomenal because i mean this is like the first book she had no way of knowing that this was going to blow up the way it did and um create a fan base that would support her through you know 15 or more books so the fact that she put it in thinking of what 
was going to happen later on, or in this case, you know, previously, it's really amazing. Let's move to the next section. Um, so the next two spots are on page 170. So there's this uh, next part, and I love this because it's like Jace thinking he's funny, and also there's a little bit more humor to it if you've already read the book. Like, you've read more into the book. So, um, so Jace uh, calls Simon Weasel Face, and Clary says, don't call him that. He doesn't look like a weasel. You might be right, said Jace. I've met an attractive weasel or two in my time. He looks more like a rat. So if you've read this book, you get why that's hilarious. But it's also funny because Jace thinks he's funny, but he's not funny. Not all the time. He's funny a lot of the time. He's got that sarcastic humor that's I find hilarious. But in this case, I'm not really sure I've ever really met an attractive weasel. So I don't know. But just the fact that he says he looks like a rat. And uh, when we get to that, in a later part in this series, uh, you'll understand why, unless you've already read the book all the way through, then, then you understand why. That's, uh, it's funny. So, um, here we have Jace being sarcastic and Clary not wanting anything to do with it. So Jace says in his, his way, I wish you'd stop desperately trying to get my attention like this. He said, it's become, it's become embarrassing. Sarcasm is the last refuge of the imaginatively bankrupt, she told him. I can't help it. I use my rapier wit to hide my inner pain. So this um, back and forth is great in two ways. One, because Clary is almost being a little bit of a hypocrite of the fact that she is like super sarcastic, especially uh, when you get her and Simon together talking about other people. The two of them are like nonstop sarcasm. So I mean pot calling the kettle black right but also because um what he's saying he's saying it like jokingly but he's also very serious like this whole idea of his um his jokes and his wit you know hiding the pain he feels and I think that's true I mean he can never really admit that and he probably doesn't even understand it himself but it's kind of what it is is he uses his sarcasm to like hide his feelings so it's also like 100% on point for Jace. Um, all right, so let's move on to page 179. So uh, we see this part here. Jace is telling Clary what the uh, Shadow Hano motto is. I mean, it's not really their motto. It's just Jace's idea of their motto. He says, it means shadow hunters looking better in black than the widows of our enemies since 1234. And Clary's like, Jace, like, stop it. You're not funny. But it's like, you, you knew he was going to give you a sarcastic answer. He just got done saying that's what he does. He's completely sarcastic all the time. But she seems like surprised that he's being sarcastic. I don't know. I also think that's funny, like Jace coming up with these things. What uh, the real motto is, the descent into hell is easy. And, you know, Jace just actually made it better. Um, so I'm going to go to page 80. So there, so in this scene, they're walking through the city of Bones, which is um, where the Silent Brothers live. It's kind of like medieval type library where the, where the Silent Brothers study and um, learn and stuff like that. So it's super dark, almost pitch black. And um, and Jace asks, you want me to hold your hand? And Clary's response is, Clary put both her hands behind her back like a small child. Don't talk down to me. Well, I could hardly talk up to you. You're too short. <laughs> I think that's funny. That's actually a funny, sarcastic moment from Jace. I'm short. I get it. I get short jokes all the time. And I kind of think that one's funny. I also don't think he's talking down to her. I think he's legit being like a nice guy and asking if she wants to hold his hand. Um, and not just because he's like flirting with her. I think it's 
not really the moment to be flirting. And I think Jace understands that. I think he just wants to, you know, be there for her to make her feel more comfortable with the situation. And she kind of like attacks him for it. And this is the first time she kind of does that. As I've uh, mentioned previously, she kind of like overreacts because I don't think she understands the situation and she's kind of like a little freaked out. So she overreacts and reacts poorly sometimes. But I think going into that situation, like maybe because she's confused, scared, frustrated, frightened, all these different things, she doesn't know how to react. Okay, so. 182. So, um, Clary asks Brother Jeremiah, the silent brother, where are the living quarters? Clary asked, partly to be polite, partly out of curiosity. Where do the brothers sleep? And um, Brother Jeremiah says, sleep? So, I mean, he's implying that they don't sleep, that they're, um, that the becoming a silent brother makes them they are other and they are different but they're still technically mortal they're not immortal they're not and um, they live a lot longer and um they don't necessarily die of old age but they can die as we will see they're not impossible to kill they're not immortal and i don't see why they wouldn't sleep it just seems like that's odd i mean i'm sure there are rooms that help wake you up and all of that but the idea that they don't sleep because of that, I don't know. So let's move on to our last point on page 186. So um, the Silent Brothers are looking through her, her mind to try and find, to, to try and unlock her memories so she can remember um, Shadow World and all of that. And um, the Silent Brothers say, the answer to that is woven into the thread of your thoughts, said Brother Jeremiah. It's your waking dream you saw it written, Magnus Bain, but that's not even a name. So Clary's saying Magnus Bain, that's not a name, Magnus, that's not a name. But Clary's always talking about like history and historical stuff and how, thin and she's like, she's super smart and you know, she's um, well read and she's never seen the name Magnus. I mean, like Roman history, Norse history, like all of that stuff, like Magnus is pretty well known, like historical type name, especially like when we're talking about the, the time of like Caesar and stuff like that. So the fact that she's never heard Magnus as a name kind of seems like a little unbelievable in general. I mean, just because you've never heard a specific name why wouldn't that be a name? It sounds like a name. And not just because I read this book and all the other books, um, but it just seems strange that she would outright say that's not a name. When Magnus at some point was a common name and if she was as well read as she is in these books, then I think she would have come across that name a time or two. Um, so that's so where we're gonna stop today at the end of chapter 10. We will um, continue on with uh, City of Bones, as you can see, we are uh, getting down. There's a lot we've already talked about and there's still, there's still a lot more, but um, we've definitely gotten through a lot of it and we'll continue on um, later this week and following weeks. So um, thank you so much for being here, for uh, listening to what I have to say and what I wanted to talk about. If you have any other thoughts and opinions on the stuff we've talked about here or previously, go ahead and leave them down in the comments and I, uh, We'll get back to you on those and we'll uh, discuss it. So until next time, I'll see you all later.